Welcome everybody to our Irish Institute for Catholic Studies public lecture today and we're incredibly delighted to have a distinguished presenter today. Professor David Finnamore is Professor in the School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy and Politics at the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice Politics in Queen's University, Belfast. His extensive research and publications and interest is focused on European integration and in particular on processes of EU treaty reform and the consequences of Brexit in the British, Northern Irish and Irish contexts. So it's a really topical and interesting and relative presentation we're going to have today and the title of this presentation is The EU Northern Ireland and Brexit, coming to terms with the protocol. Thank you so much. OK, thanks very much, uh, Patricia, and thanks everybody for, for coming along this afternoon. Um, as Patricia says, I want to look at the question of um, Northern Ireland and Brexit and the EU and coming to terms with the protocol. Um, I suppose two things with this top slide, I shouldn't have put two of these in, but secondly, um, I think there probably needs to be a question mark there as to whether we will ever come to terms with the, the protocol. Um, anyway, th there's, there's plenty that can be um, discussed around the question of uh, Northern Ireland and the, the protocol and, and Brexit. Um, what I want to do is touch on a number of things with you this afternoon um, and bring you up to date as to where we are um, with the with the protocol and some of the politics um, around it. Um, I think what I, what I will want to do is sort of ex try and explain to you a little bit about okay, what the Northern Ireland Protocol is, what it actually covers, um, why it's there, um, why it has proved particularly controversial, um, and there are numerous reasons for this, and um, we'll concentrate on, on a number of them, um, and then look at some of the attitudes that we're picking up towards the protocol in Northern Ireland. Um, I'm presenting as part of a, a larger project which we're running at Queen's, which is looking at the um, governance implications of, of the protocol. And as part of that, we've been running um, a number of uh, opinion polls. Uh, the, the most recent one was actually conducted last weekend. Um, we haven't actually got the results of that um, yet, so I'm actually going to be relying on some, some data we had from, from, from June. Um, but uh, I, I think given uh, uh, what we saw in that particular set of uh, uh, that polling, um, we're probably likely to see something not dissimilar coming through um, when we get the results from, from this time. We'll, we'll, we'll see shortly. And then what I want to do is just round off with um, a, a sense as to where things are going um, um, today, um, mid-October. Mid um, I'm going to be quite cautious about what I say because we are due to see the um, publication later, later today, early this evening, of a new set of proposals on the part of the European Union, which uh, it is hoped by many will bring um, uh, will produce some solutions to some of the ongoing issues um, which are dominating um, the implementation of the protocol and are actually leading to quite a fractious relationship between the UK and the EU. OK, so if, if I start off by just uh, taking some of the news headlines from the last uh, week or so, and you'll see here that uh, the Brexit and the protocol um, issues are featuring highly and uh, with some quite uh, dramatic headlines um, in the in the press and that is the press on, on both sides of the Irish Sea but also further afield in continental Europe. You've got there on, on the left the, the Guardian saying that uh, trade war looms as the UK is set to spurn EU offer on, on Northern Ireland. You've got on the right there the Irish Times indicating that uh, David Frost, the UK minister, is hardening his rhetoric as he demands a new version of the Northern Ireland Protocol. And then in the middle from the Telegraph um, and also the German Frankfurter Allgemeine, um, these, this idea that there's a sausage war ongoing and that uh, there's either a compromise or there's a victory pending for the UK as the EU surrenders over the British bangers being sold in Northern Ireland. OK. Um, we need to look beyond the sausage war headlines to understand what is going on here um, and uh, recognize that okay, it's it, a lot of the issues around the protocol, a lot of the issues which have led to these headlines um, have far more to do with broader political issues, issues of legitimacy around the protocol 
but also the, the very unique arrangements that the protocol creates for Northern Ireland within the context of, of Brexit. Okay. It's been a very fractious period in terms of the implementation of, of the protocol, and we can probably anticipate some of that, uh, some of that friction to, to continue. Um, but I, I think generally speaking, uh, a lot of those people directly affected by the protocol are keen to see some resolution to, to the issues which have been um, raised in the, in the recent uh, months and the last year or so. Hopefully what I can do today is to take you through some of those and we can always have a discussion at the end about any issues which you want to raise. Anyway, I suppose a, a question is, okay, well, what is the protocol and why does it exist? There's a, there's a lot of media and political uh, discussion around it. Sometimes it's, often, it's a bit misplaced. Um, and equally, there's some of the issues which uh, dominate the headlines tend to overlook other aspects of, of the protocol, protocol and also why it is there. Um, the obvious reason why it's there is Brexit. Uh, if we hadn't had Brexit, we wouldn't have had um, the we wouldn't have had the protocol. Um, I've always liked this cartoon by by from the from the Economist, uh, which probably uh, conveys the sense that uh, amongst a lot of people that well, Northern Ireland's been taken out of the of the EU by essentially an English um, vote. I think that's a sentiment which is also felt, also expressed quite often in in Scotland. Um, there's a big difference, though, in Scotland being taken out of the EU through Brexit and Northern Ireland being taken out of it. Um, and that is essentially because of this thing, the border, the land border, um, and not only any old land border, uh, a land border which obviously has been, has always been politically um, contested. Um, and it's quite a lot of people obviously point to the fact that one of the reasons why we had the troubles was because of the existence of that land border, because of the partition. Um, of, of the island and a desire on some of them to, to over, overcome that, that, that partition. Um, we also know that that border through shared membership between Ireland and the UK of the EU, as well as the peace process, has been transformed. Um, if you take the top two pictures there on the right, you've got the customs posts which, it, which existed. You've also got the security infrastructure, which was along the border during the, the Troubles. Um, and there, bottom right, you have the, the border as it is today. Um, quite a remarkable transformation um, and such that anywhere you cross the border, you've got in this picture the two, the only two real indications of that border existing today. And that is those occasional signs um, welcome you to Northern Ireland, but also then the change in the colour markings on the road. Um, that's a huge transformation of, of, of the border. And for many, um, that, that transformation is, is a consequence of the, uh, it, and it's symbolic of the, the peace process and the changes which we've seen within Northern Ireland in particular, but also on the island of Ireland over the last 20 years or so. And therefore, if you have to reimpose a border, um, you could be undermining that peace process. Okay. What we've also had as part of the uh, discourse around Brexit and the reasons why you have the protocol is obviously the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and the sense that um, if you take the UK out of the EU and Ireland remains in it, you change quite fundamentally the context in which significant elements of the, the um, Belfast Good Friday Agreement were being implemented particularly in terms of North-South cooperation, um, that uh, if you take the UK out of the e EU, Ireland remains in, then the, the, the regulatory framework shifts quite considerably. And that as a consequence of that, some of the North-South cooperation can be undermined. Um, we're already seeing that in terms of the, the idea of the Good Friday Agreement promoting the all-island economy, um, that um, Yes, you've got a lot of emphasis on the moment on the East-West movement of goods, but um, as a consequence of the UK's relationship with the EU changing, we no longer have free movement of services on the island. We no longer have free movement of, of EU citizens on the island. We no longer have free movement of capital. Okay, that's going to be disruptive. Um, and so the, the reason why we have the protocol is that both the EU and the UK recognise that with Brexit, with the UK leaving the EU, you change quite fundamentally the context on the island of Ireland and that you probably need to have particular arrangements, special arrangements put in place where you try and manage the implications of Brexit such that you don't see 
a physical hardening of the border. You don't see a return to infrastructure, but that you maintain conditions um, as best you can, such that the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement is not overly disrupted. Okay. So the, the protocol exists as a, as a reaction to um, some key developments in, in the last 20, 30 years of the history on, on, the, on the island and desire to maintain as much of the status quo as possible. Now, this was recognised if we go back to the European Council, the EU's heads of government, heads of state responding to the UK's de decision to leave. Um, we have here um, the statement which was issued by the heads of government, heads of state on the 29th of April, where they stated that the union has consistently supported the goal of peace and reconciliation enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement in all its parts and continuing to support and protect the achievements, benefits and commitments of the peace process will remain of paramount importance. And then we have a crucial line as far as the protocol is concerned. In view of the unique circumstances on the island of Ireland, flexible and imaginative solutions will be required, including with the aim of avoiding a hard border while respecting the integrity of the union legal order. In this context, the union should also recognise existing bilateral agreements and arrangements between the United Kingdom and Ireland, which are compatible with EU law. Okay. In essence, what we see in this um, statement by the European Council is that in the context of Brexit, the EU is willing to find flexible and imaginative solutions which help avoid a hardening of the border, but also address other issues related to the unique circumstances on, on the island of Ireland. Okay. Now, a number of us followed closely what the what was happening during the negotiations. Um, and as a consequence, we, we pulled together a number of little charts and diagrams. Um, this is one summary of the protocol, which uh, my colleague Katie Hayward and I have, have produced. Um, I'm not expecting to go through all of it, but if I just flag a number of things on there. Um, protocol does a number of things. It pr puts in place arrangements whereby, as you see in paragraph two there, there is no, there is to be no diminution of rights, safeguards and equality of opportunity as set out in the 1998 agreement as a consequence of Brexit. So provisions are put in place where certain bits of EU law relating to citizens' rights, rights of individuals continue to apply. You then got in the in the lighter pink version, um, what's probably the most um, controversial element of the protocol, and, and that is the arrangements which essentially keep Northern Ireland in the European Union single market for goods, keep Northern Ireland in the customs territory of the EU, essentially so that you can then avoid any physical infrastructure on the border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, that we keep the border as is on the island. What that means is that the UK, in respect of Northern Ireland, has to keep applying EU law and also has to accept the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice in Luxembourg. It's a unique set of arrangements, uh, which obviously are politically controversial, but the reason why they exist is essentially to keep the border as it currently is. Um, there's also a practical dimension in the, in the green box in the middle. Electricity on the island is, is distributed on, on an all-island or, or produced on an all-island basis. There's a single electricity market. Um, and therefore, you basically need Northern Ireland to remain part of that if you're to maintain electricity supplies. Okay. There's references there to North South cooperation as well. What, what we also see, what we also see, is a set of institutional arrangements established, which um, allow for the um, operation of the uh, agreement, um, whether in terms of implementation, whether in terms of adopting decisions around the. the the, the, the development of, of the protocol. And then importantly, what we see on the right hand side, the penultimate box, number 18, we see a mechanism for democratic consent, a mechanism which essentially allows members of the Stormont Assembly, of the Northern Ireland Assembly, every four years to take a view, a vote on whether to continue the application of core elements of the protocol. And those core elements are essentially those which relate to the free movement of goods and avoiding a hardening of the border on the island of Ireland. Um, that first vote is going to be in 2024 and is likely to be quite a significant moment for the future of, of the protocol. Um, we'll see what happens then. But, uh, for the moment, the, uh, the focus is on trying to make this protocol work to actually implement it. Okay. 
What's controversial about the protocol is clearly the trading regime that it creates. Um, um, because what effectively the protocol does is shift or move the border, which would normally apply between um, the whole of the UK and the EU, and so along the Ireland, Northern Ireland border to the sea. Because the essential uh, point for the European Union is that if goods are entering its market, it needs to know what's coming in. It needs to ensure that they comply with EU regulation. It needs to ensure that customs formalities are met. And if you're not going to have the border on the island of Ireland, then it has essentially, from the EU perspective, move to the Irish Sea. Now, this is problematic, obviously, for the UK and has been resisted quite strongly by uh, many unionists um, because they see that border as a, um, a, a weakening of the position of Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom. And some would even go as far as saying it's, it's designed as such to undermine the position of Northern Ireland in the UK. And then this feeds into broader discussions about what the constitutional future is of Northern Ireland and clearly the prospect, the possibility of a united Ireland. Now, the, the reason why we have this issue um, is really because of the nature of Brexit. Um, and the what um, colleague Daniel Kellerman has identified as the Brexit trilemma, uh, that once the UK set its red lines of leaving the single market and of leaving the EU customs union, it could no longer, it had to choose between a border between Ireland and Northern Ireland or a border between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. This is because you cannot deliver on the three promises which are highlighted in this trilemma. If you want to leave the single market and customs union and you don't want a border between Ireland and, and Northern Ireland, then you have to put a border in the Irish Sea. If you're leaving the single market and the customs union and you do not want a border between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, so no, no Irish Sea border, then you've got to put a border on the land. Uh, if you want to avoid borders in both places, then the UK has to stay in the single market and the customs union but that's politically unacceptable to the UK um, political um, par party, or at least the UK government. Um, the only possible solution is D in the middle, and no one's actually worked out what that might be. Indeed, some people refer it to as, uh, that space as a space for unicornology, because that's only the only people or only entities which exist there are unicorns. Okay. So we, we have the protocol essentially as an attempt to resolve this, 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 tr this tr trilemma. Um, ultimately, what was prioritised was no border between Ireland and Northern Ireland, um, and therefore the border had to fall in the Irish Sea. Okay, as I said, um, that leads to to, to to the protocol, um, and we've got this vote coming up in 2024 on whether that arrangement for for trade, um, the border in the Irish Sea as opposed to the border on 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 the land border. Um, will continue and that's going to be for a decision of the members of the Legislative Assembly, the MLAs up in Stormont in, in November, December 2024. Um, I think the expectation was that things would settle and then we'd have a reasoned, reasoned debate and discussion and uh, the, they, the MLAs would vote in 2024. That's obviously not been the case as we've seen through the uh, political politics around the protocol and the various differences of opinion which have been expressed about it and a lot of the tension that we see between the UK and the EU on its implementation within that the tensions between the UK and, and Ireland. Okay so um, as I said at the beginning we're doing a lot of work at Queen's on the protocol. This is part of a, a, a larger project on what's referred we refer to as governance for a place between um, looking at the multiple dynamics of implementing the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland. And as part of that, we've been looking at the public opinion on the protocol um, through a number of online polls we, we've conducted. And what I'd like to do is just share with you um, some of the findings of that. So you get a sense as to sort of the extent of concerns that, it, that exist um, and, and, and also um, some of the, the attitudes which are emerging towards the protocol and its, its uh, handling by, by government and politicians. Um, as we've seen the first sort of nine months of implementation. Okay, um, we asked voters what their views were on Brexit and the protocol. Um, 
And as you see uh, at the top there, um, some people doubt whether there's much reliable information on, on the protocol. Um, they're, they're split on that. Um, that said, it's quite surprising that people think they have a good understanding of the protocol. Uh, that's possibly because there's a fair amount of political leadership on this. Um, and uh, one might assume that people will be following what uh, political leaders are, are saying, which suggests they might have an understanding. Now, whether they do have a good understanding is premised on the assumption that uh, those political leaders have a good understanding of the protocol. And I think from certainly the analysis we've been doing uh, suggests that's not always the case. Uh, what you see is um, a, ma a majority indicating that Brexit on balance is, is not good for, for the UK. Um, but equally, um, the society being divided in terms as to whether the protocol is on balance good for Northern Ireland. Um, very, very closely, um, uh, clo close uh, numbers um, there. But, e but importantly, what's to note there is there's no clear majority either supporting or opposing um, the protocol. Uh, that probably explains why there's a fair amount of contestation um, around the protocol at the moment. What is striking, though, is the bottom uh, figure of uh, where you see political arrangements for Northern Ireland as actually being necessary. Um, two thirds of people acknowledge that in the context of Brexit, you probably do need particular arrangements for Northern Ireland. Um, the question is, what should those be? Um, and there's obviously clear differences on those. OK, so that's some general opinion on Brexit. What we also then found was what people think um, the impact of the protocol has been. And I think what's striking here is the concerns which exist around the negative impact that uh, the protocol and Brexit have had on stability in Northern Ireland. The, the figures here represent those who agree and those who disagree, or those minus, minus those who disagree. So um, you've got clear indication there that, about concerns around political stability. You've got clear indications of people's concerns about Northern Ireland's constitutional position in the United Kingdom. You've also got serious concerns there about the impact of Brexit and protocol on the UK EU relationship and British Irish relationships. Other areas attract less concern, but um, I think what we've certainly seen with Brexit and, and the protocol is opening up or engendering greater political debate, greater political instability in Northern Ireland. And quite serious concerns there about what the, 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 the impact that uh, Brexit and the protocol are, are having in a number of areas. What we also was asking was what people felt were, what, what, the extent to which people were concerned about different um, uh, issues. Um, and you see here in red, those areas where people are expressing quite significant concern around issues. Um, concern around cost of goods, choice of goods coming in, um, but then politically also whether Northern Ireland's voice was being heard and whether what was happening in, in the protocol was really open to, to scrutiny. Um, We've summed this up in, in the expression that uh, the protocol is often seen as something which is being done to Northern Ireland rather than necessarily something being done with Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, we'll be interested to see the way in which uh, there's a reaction to the proposals which are coming through from the Commission later today, because certainly the, the EU is framing those as uh, responses to issues being raised in Northern Ireland. Um, as I say, we'll, we'll see what the reaction is to those. But I think what's striking about this particular graphic and the responses we got is how concerned people are about some core issues there. OK, um, what we also looked at was levels of trust in Northern Ireland in various actors in, in the process. Um, what you see there is down at the bottom, quite a stunning figure. Um, for the lack of distrust or the lack of trust, so the amount of distrust um, in the UK government. 86% um, of people in Northern Ireland, this survey drew on responses from over two and a half thousand people, um, distrust or distrust the UK government a lot. Okay. Not far behind was distrust in, in, in the DUP. Um, the only group which we asked about that was trusted were business representatives. 
Um, so 56% of people are either trust or trust them a lot. Now, in terms of the politics of Northern Ireland, we obviously anticipate a lot of distrust, um, um, certainly towards unionist political parties from people who would identify as nationalist and nationalist parties to those who would identify as unionists. So in some respects, we shouldn't be surprised that there's high levels of distrust around, but it is very, very striking the extent to which the, um, there are high levels of distrust in, in the UK government. Um, the EU and the Irish government fare better, um, but it's, I think it's, it's fair to say one would anticipate many people with a nationalist persuasion probably expressing trust in the EU and the Irish government. Um, um, we'll see again how those figures um, adjust in the light of more recent developments when we see the poll findings from, from last weekend. Okay. Final slide um, relates to how voters would like to see members of the of Stormont, the MLAs voting in 2024. Um, and what you see here is 46% um, arguing or wanting their MLAs to vote in favour of, of the continue, continued application of the protocol. And we see 45% wanting um, MLAs to vote against continued application of the protocol. That's not a recipe for stability and certainty. Um, there is no clear majority either way, which reflects the contestation around the protocol and the concerns which exist within society and certainly suggests that we're in for a period of continued contestation um, and that in some respects, the vote or in many respects, the vote in 2024 is too close to call at this stage. The significance of that is that if you do see a vote against the app continued application of those core elements of the protocol, the protocol will cease to apply, at least these articles will cease to apply after two years, which in the absence of any solution means to say we're back to the prospect of a physical hardening of the border on the island of Ireland, with Northern Ireland being in the UK, uh, as part of the UK being outside the single market and outside the customs union. So in many respects, fixing um, many of the problems which people identify with the protocol, which people see in the protocol, whether they are legitimate or whether they are essentially politi more politically driven, or they're legitimate issues or whether they're more politically driven, um, it, is, it needs to be a, a top priority in, in, the, in the coming weeks and months and years if we're going to bring this post-Brexit stability to, to Northern Ireland. As I said, we'd be interested to see how um, views have shifted, if they have shifted at all in the light of more recent polling data. Um, but uh, given that the contestation which is around at the moment, I wouldn't necessarily anticipate seeing much of a shift here um, as, as basically Northern Ireland remains pretty divided on the protocol. OK, so where next for the protocol? Um, we saw the headlines earlier. Um, we're probably going to see more of those in, in due course. But um, I think what's also important to note and timely that we're doing this lecture discussion today is that we are expecting there to be various proposals coming forward from the EU this evening on how to address some of the challenges, some of the issues around the implementation of, of the protocol. Um, and these, so we're led to believe, are going to be about how do you reduce the frictions on the movement of goods from Great Britain into Northern Ireland? How do you essentially reduce that sense of there being an Irish sea border? Um, what we've also anticipating are some uh, uh, proposals coming in into force, which would or being proposed, um, which would see the free flow of medicines from Great Britain into Northern Ireland. One of the consequences of the protocol would be um, additional uh, restrictions on the movement of medicines from Great Britain into Northern Ireland. And obviously, one can appreciate that this is a very sensitive issue um, in, in Northern Ireland, and not just in, in, a, in, a, in a pandemic um, context. Um, serious questions being raised as to whether you can maintain the free flow of medicines into Northern Ireland. Um, and then what we're also seeing, what we also anticipate seeing later today, are proposals around how you actually enhance the input from Northern Ireland on the protocol. How do you um, uh, narrow that gap um, in terms of ensuring Northern Ireland's voice is heard in the implementation of the protocol, that this generally becomes something which is done with Northern Ireland as opposed to Northern Ireland. Now, the proposals will come later today. We're then expecting there to be some discussion between the UK and the EU and hopefully a deal, um, a deal which would 
smoothen the the implementation of the protocol and remove some of the political contestation around it. Um, but that's not a foregone conclusion. We cannot guarantee that that's going to be the case, um, not least because the UK government has been quite insistent um, throughout the summer that actually the, the grounds exist in Northern Ireland because of what it sees as the economic and social disruption that the protocol has caused, that it has a right to trigger Article 16 and the safeguard clause and effectively suspend the operation of, of the protocol. Um, now, that may be something which is being politically supported on certain sides, particularly by those who oppose the protocol and what it means for Northern Ireland in the, in the UK and its position with, in regards to the EU, but equally others would argue, well, A, there may not be sufficient grounds to do so, but also what do you actually achieve by triggering Article 60 other than bringing greater uncertainty to an already uncertain, disrupted um, situation? Okay, so it'd be very interesting to see what's happening over the, over the next couple of the months and whether issues are resolved. Pressure to resolve them exists because we've got the Northern Ireland Assembly elections coming up in May 2022, and those are going to be crucial for determining the composition of the assembly for that vote in 2024 when we have democratic consent and essentially the future of core elements of the protocol formally if not essentially the protocol as a whole um, politically being called into question um, we'll have to see but uh, suffice to say although the headlines today may suggest that uh, we may be entering a new phase where things will be resolved um, I, don't, I think it's also fair to say that we're not going to see the politics around the protocol disappearing quickly. This is because it does treat Northern Ireland differently to the rest of the UK. It's something which is going to be continuously resisted by certain elements of unionism, um, although other elements may be open to accepting some of the proposals which the EU is putting forward um, today as the means of trying to um, remove some of the instability of politics and try and find a little bit more certainty and stability um, for Northern Ireland over the, over the coming years. So um, be interesting to see how things do pan out over the, over the coming months. Um, but hopefully what I've managed to do there is give you a sense as to why we have the protocol, what its core elements are and some of the uh, attitudes which exist towards it and equally some of the concerns um, which exist and how some of those issues may be on the verge of being addressed as a consequence of discussions between the UK and the EU. Okay. So thanks very much for your attention. I'll, I'll stop there, stop sharing this um, screen and happy to take any questions on what I've said or possibly what I've not said about the protocol.